Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Reaper Minis TV. We're going to start off this episode jumping back into Warlord, and we're still going to be talking about ranged or shooting combat, and we're going to pick up with our example where we have our handful of cavemen that are being used as bull orc archers, and we're going to be shooting this time at two bugbear warriors. Our cavemen or bull orc archers still have a ranged attack value of 4, they have a range value of 12 and 18, so if they're at 12 or less inches to the target, there's no negative to hit. And here we see that they're all well within range. And what we're going to do differently for shooting at multiple targets is we have to declare who's shooting at what before we roll any dice. So you can see here I've got two orange dice that are going to be the shots at the lower bugbear and three white dice represent the three shots that are going to go into the upper one. The bugbears have a base defensive value or DV of 11 so along with the RAV of four of my bull orc archers or cavemen I'm looking for at least seven pluses on the dice to begin with. However the bugbears have a special ability called deflect and they have a deflect rating of one. What that means is against missile or ranged combat that the bugbears have a plus one to their DV. So now they have a 12, which means now I'm looking for eight pluses on my rolls to hit. And on our roll, we see we have a nine, a seven, a one, another one, and then a 10. And now, just to make it a little easier for the example, we have the dice that went into each bugbear next to each bugbear. On the bottom, you see we have the 1 and the 10. On the top, we have the 1, the 7, and the 9. Now, the bottom, the 1 and the 10 with the RAV of the cavemen turns into a 5 and a 14. On the top, it turns into a 5, an 11, and a 13. If you remember originally, we had a DV of 11, but it was plus one because of deflect, so it's a 12. 12s are what we're looking for. On the bottom, the five and the 14 is one hit and one miss. On the top, the five and the 11 and the 13 is two misses and one hit. So the result of this attack is that each bugbear suffers one wound or has one of their damage tracks marked off. That means they're going to be a little less powerful in the game. They'll be a little easier to hurt for the rest of the battle here, but they're both still very much in the fight. And as it turns out, the deflect ability ended up saving the top bugbear. Had they not had that, he would have suffered two wounds or had two damage tracks marked off. Bugbear warriors have two damage tracks, so he would have been eliminated outright because of this attack had it not been for his deflect ability. Now, each of the opposing sides in this shooting combat each have one special ability that we haven't talked about yet. Neither one of these abilities will affect the outcome of this particular attack, but they're worth talking about just to give you some insight into how they work in the game. Bull orc archers have the pierce ability, and we've talked about this before, and what this means is if they roll three or more above what they needed to to hit their target, they cause an extra wound. So in this case, the total would have needed to be 15s to cause an extra wound, which they couldn't have done. The best they're going to hope for is a 10, which is an automatic hit and wound anyway, so they couldn't get to roll an 11 on a 10-sided dice. So their pierce wasn't going to come into play on this particular attack, but on the next one, since the DV of the bugbears is down to 10, it could come into play, but it really won't matter then either because the bugbears have just one damage track left. The bugbears have the tough ability, and they have a tough rating of zero. And what that means is if they get killed, if you do enough damage to wipe out their last damage track before you remove them from the board, you get to roll a d10 and add their tough rating to it. And if you roll a 10 or higher, you get to leave them in the game with their last damage track intact. So for the bugbears, they have a 10% chance of staying in the game after any killing hit. With models that have a tough rating of two or three or four, they just have a greater chance of staying in the game after they should have normally been killed. Okay, we're going to get back to some reviews now. We'll be going back to Warlord rules in future episodes, but right now we're going to see a couple of new chronoscope miniatures. And the first one is Dr. Totenkranz. And this is a multi-piece miniature where you get the base model itself, which is the guy sitting in the floating chair, you get a large piece of tubing that goes from his left side down around the back of the model and then glues on in the back where the engine parts of the model are. 
You also get a flying stand that glues into a normal round base that most chronoscope miniatures come with. Now, Dr. Totenkranz is a big, fat guy who's got lots and lots of rolls of diseased flesh, and there are several tubes and wires that are going into his body itself, including one very large tube that connects up to his groin that looks like a giant catheter, and that trails back to some kind of collection bottle or something on the backside of his whole flying mechanism. There are just tons of details all over his giant flying chair. There's a TV screen or some kind of monitor over on one side. There's lots of tubes and wires and little buttons and stuff everywhere on it. All sorts of things connect to him. And there are just so many cool details on this model, even though he's a big, giant, fat, diseased guy that's sitting in a flying chair. Now, I don't think I'm mistaken to say that he's reminiscent at least a little bit of Baron Harkonnen from Dune, or at least from the movie that I remember from the 80s, the ill-fated movie with Sting in it, but he reminds me of that a little bit. He would work in pretty much any non-fantasy genre. You could use him as a modern-day sort of super science villain in a regular kind of campaign or a superhero campaign. He could obviously be used in a futuristic game. You could use him as some kind of Nazi super science experiment in Secrets of the Third Reich or something like that. And I could even see him working as a chaos sorcerer in a 40k army of chaos space marines. So I think there's lots of uses for this model. It's highly detailed. I like it a lot. Uh, just very good all-around model. Next up is General Drake, and this is a single-piece model of a military-type figure who's wearing a long trench coat. He's got a cigar or cigarette in his left hand. His right hand is at his waist, sort of holding his trench coat open a little bit. You can see that he's wearing what, at least to me, looks like a pretty regular uniform. His hat has a little emblem on the top of the front, but nothing that is specific to any nationality or anything, so you could probably use him any way you wanted. On his chest, over on the left side, you can make out a couple of medals there, and cleanup was basically just limited to a few little mold lines. The most significant was across the top of his head where his hat is, but other than that, he was based cleaned and ready to prime in about a minute or so. So you could use him in a modern or World War II era kind of military game. You could use him in a futuristic game as either a player character or maybe the leader of a group that the PCs are fighting against. Um, good model here. Looks like he'd paint up real quick. Next up are some fantasy models, and the first is a set of slimes, and you get two models in this blister, both are single piece miniatures, and neither one required a whole lot of cleanup. There was a mold line visible on each one of them, but it was mostly around the bottom part of the figure itself. I guess you can call a slime a figure. But one is sort of more of a, a widespread or spread out kind of bubbling slime that's oozing along the ground. The other is sort of arching up or surging forward towards whatever it's trying to attack. For DMs in D&D &D or Pathfinder, if you're doing a dungeon crawl or maybe some kind of encounter down in a sewer or something like that, these would be ideal. I think they'll paint up really quick. Cleanup was next to nothing and for me, they're just a good addition to my group of monsters. Next up is a harpy. This is a two-piece miniature where the wings come as a separate piece, but they glue perfectly into a notch in her back. There is a little bit of nudity to the model. She is bare-chested, so if it's not right for your gaming table, then it's not right for your gaming table. There is an alternate of this kind of miniature in the Warlord line that is fully clothed on the top. So if you need or want one that's not showing off as much skin, then that's the way to go. There was some additional cleaning on this model where there's a tab of metal that runs from her left foot down to the base. That's part of the casting process that needs to be clipped off. Her wings down at the bottom and up at the top where they're kind of feathered had some little bits of metal webbing that needed to be trimmed away. And down on her claws on both of her hands, there were some extra little bits of metal from the casting process. So take a couple more minutes to clean her up than some other models, but I like the pose. She looks like she's swooping down for an attack. Details are excellent on the model from the feathers to the scaly skin to the regular kind of humanoid skin. Great model here. I'm going to pick up a couple more of these and the Warlord ones to use in a Dark Elf army as harpies, but obviously they'd have the same kind of use in D&D &D or any kind of fantasy role-playing game. Thanks for watching this episode of Reaper Minis TV. We'll see you next time.